Hi, and welcome to another Fix Your Gut video blog. My name is Jason Hooper, and I'm here with Dr. Larry Weiss. He is a board certified anesthesiologist, graduate from Stan Stanford Medical School. He's the chief medical officer for AO Biome, the makers of AO Plus, and he's also the co founder of a company called Cleanwell. It's, uh, it, they make household cleaning products with uh, a zero footprint, environmentally friendly stuff, very interesting stuff. Welcome to the show, uh, Dr. Watt. Thanks for inviting me. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how you made the transition from being an anesthesiologist into going into infection prevention? So a couple of things that happened while I was, after, after I was uh, graduated from medical school was we transformed medicine by turning it from being a profession into being a business. By the way, this was a profoundly stupid idea because it changed the incentives in very subtle ways that changed people's behavior. And as a result, we were less focused on how it was. If you're running a business, you're more concerned about selling. It. If you're taking care of patients, you're more concerned about the health of their product. When you intermingle these things, what happens is those incentives don't always work in the right direction for the patient. Businesses work best by selling more stuff, but that's always not in the best interest of the health of your patient. Um, and so this was in the 1990s. Um, there were all kinds of interesting things happening in biotechnology in the Bay Area. And I got very involved in things that had a dramatic impact on outcomes, particularly outcomes in public health. Awesome. So uh, the products in, in Cleanwell, uh, from what I've read, they, they use uh, thiol, right, which is an IPMP antibacterial phenol. Very, very uh, good for, for killing off germs. Uh, that's a brilliant idea. It's, it's, you read something like that and, and you think, man, I wish I would have thought of that. How, how did you get the inspiration for this and how did you implement it into a cleaning solution? So I've been thinking about the microbiome for a while, and our relationship to the microbial world has been very colored by the combination of the germ theory, which came out of all sorts of, um, and I understand where it came from, it came from all sorts of uh, outbreaks and illnesses that affected a lot of people. And to get everyone's head pointed in the same direction, what we did is we created this war metaphor, we're at war with this or we're at war with something else. And the consumer products industries, the Lysols, the Cloroxes, they rapidly capitalize. It's essentially chemical warfare on this. But in fact, the truth is we live in a microbial world. And we are immersed in it. It's essential for our good health. So I've been thinking of the, about the microbiome since even long before I started Cleanwell. Cleanwell started in 2005. And people misunderstand what Cleanwell was about. I co-founded this with IDEO, the design firm. And the idea was if you're going to change things, you need to keep people where they are. And right now, most of the products that people are using to clean their homes that are antibacterial contain a group of chemical called, chemicals that are called dimethyl benzyl quarks. The easiest way to think of this is this is the benzalkonium chloride group. These are very toxic chemicals that don't belong in people's homes. Their toxicity is not acute. You can get it on your skin, you can get it in your eye, and it's not going to produce acute damage. But the subacute, chronic exposure, the exposure to these chemicals over a long period of time, they're immune adjuvants. So they ramp up your immune response to any given environmental stimulant. Think of an immune adjuvant the same way we use it with a vaccine. I've got a very precious little antigen I want to make sure when I give it to you, you get a nice robust response, but I want to make sure I, everyone who gets it and that it goes around it as much as possible. So I add an adjuvant and the adjuvant amplifies your response. The chemical in most common disinfecting problem, products, the Lysols, the Cloroxes, the Mr. Cleans, even hand sanitizing products, products like Baby Ganix are this benzalkonium chloride group. And we live in an age of immune hypersensitivity. If you look at the illnesses that the children of the millennial generation have, these moms are shocked to see their kids have illnesses they never had. Asthma, eczema, all sorts of immune hypersensitivity illnesses are on the rise. And it corresponds with the introduction, the massive introduction of this group of chemicals. So Cleanwell was there to, again, we founded Cleanwell in 2005 
to introduce an alternative, meet them where they were. They believe they were at war with the, with the microbial world. We just gave them a product that looked and performed as good or better than the products they were using, but didn't have the toxicity because we essentially asked the question, how does nature solve the problem? And then the idea was to take them on a journey so they understood that they're not at war with the microbial world. The microbial world is essential for your good health. And we were going to take them on a journey. Now, what happened was, you know, do I think people need all these microbial, pro antimicrobial products they're using? The cleaner disinfectants, the hand sanitizers, things like that. No, they don't. But if I could catch them into the stream and take them on that journey, I could transform their behavior. Ideas transform behavior, but it's really, really hard. But products transform behavior dramatically. So we're going to introduce them to products and take them on a journey to the point where ultimately they use less of these products. We change the chemistry so it's safe, and we change the idea and the relationship so that ultimately we start to live in harmony with the microbial world, world which is the world we live in. And that's where CleanWell went. Now, when the idea of AOBiome was introduced to me by a friend and colleague, a gentleman named Jamie Haywood, who started a company called Patients Like Me, the idea that we could actually identify the healthy state of the microbiome and restore it rather than introduce some new novel um, foreign chemical that the body has never seen and treat the symptoms was incredibly ambitious. This is again, this was in about 2010. We started working on it and you can see the history of the development of uh, AOBiome. Um, it's in the New York Times Magazine article. Yeah, I saw that, May 2014. So the idea that we developed here is rather uh, So you were talking about uh, nature's solution to a problem. So you have a plant that is getting, uh, that, that's exposed to bacteria and, and micro, and, and, and you know, they, they're exposed to infection. And so the plant thyme or oregano, you know, it, it creates these phenols to ward off bacteria that are, are gonna try to make it sick. And so what your solution was is to use those chemicals rather than to use artificial man-made chemicals uh, to, to clean the house. And that way, you know, we don't get sick, which is another layer to the hygiene hypothesis. Um, and, you know, just something else that's unnatural that's disrupting our ecosystem. That's pretty much correct. What we did is we looked for a biomimetic mimetic solution. We said, how does nature solve this problem? Not what can I make in the laboratory that nature's never seen before? But if you look at these plants, and they're from the mint family, we have coexisted with these problems, with these plants everywhere we have evolved. So how do we how do we ask and answer the question? What is the biomimetic? What is the natural solution to it? And 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 we did fairly well with it. But in the meantime, people have become remarkably accepting of the idea that. Bacteria are not necessarily all bad. And there is a transformation, and a major transformation, in people's understanding of their relationship to the microbial world. So when the option to work in something like uh, with AOBiome, with these ammonia oxidizing bacteria, gives us a chance to really try to map a path back to the native, wild human state. So I'll give you some examples. In the few examples where we can identify Aboriginal people who we have not introduced a lot of products into, they don't have things like acne, doesn't exist, eczema, psoriasis, rosacea. These are all diseases of the modern skin. And think of the skin as a biomarker for our general physiology. These are inflammatory disorders. What we're looking at is chemically induced dysbioses, where we took some chemistry we knew very little about. So let's, the reason you don't have ammonia oxidizing bacteria on your skin right now is because soap kills it. Now you might, because you have a box right over there over your shoulder, yeah. and if you've been applying it. Um, <laughs> but the reason that most people don't have it is because with the best of intentions and in response to a number of health problems, we decided we needed to use soap. It turns out soap kills 
these keystone peacekeeper bacteria that lived on your skin. And what they did is they changed dramatically the skin chemistry by doing so. So we took chemistry we knew very little about, and we applied it to this organ system, skin microbiome, that we didn't even know existed. What could possibly go wrong with that? And if you compare the health that we have with chronic illness, we have any are going to turn out to be chemically induced dysbioses, whether in their gut, or in the skin, or in the mouth, in oral care, or vaginal, or any place where we have an interfacial tissue with the, where the microbiome is critical to, critical to health, we need to be much more circumspect about the things that we do that disturb it. And to the extent that we can understand this and understand the ways that it might change it, as I said, we're not planning on going back to live as hunter-gatherers, but maybe if we understood what we were doing, we would be able to make smarter decisions. So. If you go downstairs to the hotel gym and you see people exercising, after they're done with their workout, what do you think is going to be the first thing that they do? So since I did that this morning, I can answer that for you. A number of them will grab the, 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 the wipe that's up there in the dispenser, by the way, most of which contain these dimethyl benzyl quats like benzyl calcium chloride, and in the interest of their health, they will expose themselves to an immune adjuvant chemical, again, to try to improve their health. Now, we all live together. And by the way, I am not suggesting that hand hygiene isn't critically important. It absolutely is. We don't live as we did as hunter-gatherers. And because the things that we do with our hands, we put our hands into parts of the world that most of us don't put other parts of our body into. So hand washing, it's absolutely essential to public health. There was a huge Navy study that was published in 2001 called Operation Cough. This was carried out at um, the Naval Great Lakes Training Center, which is north of Chicago. We trained 40 or 50,000 sailors a year there. And during their eight-week tenure, these young, healthy people, 90% of them get sick. So the study that they did is they ordered them to wash their hands with plain old soap and water, unobserved, five times a day. An unobserved hand washing in an 18 to 21 year old naval recruit it turns out it's three to five seconds. And because they were under orders to do it, half of them actually did it. So 50% compliance with three to five seconds of soap and water five times a day, over a million man a week study, only the Navy can do that kind of stuff, produced a 45% reduction in respiratory illness. Hand washing matters. But do we need antibacterial chemicals to do that? No, we don't. In fact, although they didn't do this arm of the study, I would wonder very much what would happen if they did what I will call the man's hand washing, where you rinse your hand under, your water, under the water and you wash it, wipe it on your jeans, because that might even be enough to do it. In other words, what we need to do with hand hygiene hasn't really changed. But we haven't, in fact, calibrated about what the best practice is. Either way, 50% of compliance with that will make a difference for the spread of respiratory and possibly gastrointestinal illness. But what you do with the rest of your skin microbiome has dramatic impact on your health. And what we're doing with AOBiome is we're trying to understand what the healthy state is rather than let's pick a symptom, pick a disease, poke around in the mechanism, identify some novel, patentable, foreign substance we can introduce to ameliorate the symptom. And, and when we do that, we're actually pretty good at ameliorating that symptom. But we're not moving the system back to the healthy state. We've taken a very different approach. We're trying to find out what health is and figure out how to get you back there. So in relation to hygiene, if we can get away from uh, these man-made uh, benzoic chemicals and, and switch to more natural chemicals, that's one thing. But what about the things that we don't necessarily have control over? like the additives in our tap water. You know, you, you use water to wash your hands and there's chlorine, there's chloramines, there's all kinds of stuff in there that uh, that gets that gets on your skin and that, that changes the dynamic of the biome as well, correct? Everything, you know, everything's more complicated. This is Weiss's first law. Everything is more complicated than, than we expect it is. Now, what we've discovered, particularly with chloramine, which dissociates and creates ammonia, you can actually identify ammonia oxidizing bacteria in municipal water systems. 
So whereas I think high level of chlor high levels of chlorine, you know, pools, some water systems will definitely move the system away from the healthy state. We still don't have enough information to determine to what extent that interferes with generating a healthy microbiome. I'm not saying it does or doesn't, it's just that the data isn't in yet, and we need to do those studies. What we have discovered in some of the, the cosmetic studies we've done with AOBiome is uh, we did what's referred to as a biome reconstitution experiment. So we took 25 people, 20 got active, 5 got placebo. Uh, they administered for the first week, they stopped using soap and shampoo above the neck. They administered the, uh, our, the mist, the stuff over your shoulder there, twice a day. At the end of the first week, um, those people who used the mist, all of them had an active ammonia oxidizing biofilm on their microbiome. Second week, they stopped using the mist. Again, no soap, no shampoo, but continued to shower. And at that point in time, um, about 60% still had an active functioning AOB microbiome. Um, third week, they went back to using soap and shampoo. And at the end of the third week, only one subject still had an active functioning microbiome. And it turns out she had not gone, she had not started using soap and shampoo. This was actually the woman who was a New York Times Magazine reporter. And so the stuff that's in our water systems does definitely have an effect. But within the context of the way no people normally, you know, shower, it doesn't seem to that dramatically interfere with this. Again, more studies are needed. And again, we're talking about uh, people who had a, two, uh, had a full week of twice a day administration of the uh, bacteria to their skin. So what I'm planning on doing uh, to design my own uh, citizen experiment, I, I've got this kit. Um, I've got this kit from Ubiome, and yep. I could just take a swab. You know, I've been using this stuff. I plan on using it for a month, and I'm I'm not using any any soap right now or any shampoo products. And I'm just going to take a swab and see how well it's surviving on the skin. And they just send it to the lab, and it should be able to confirm uh, whether or not it's working. Right. So let's let's look let's parse this into a couple of questions. Once the um, nitrosomonas bacteria. It's fully word into your skin. It represents less than a tenth of a percent of the bacterial census. Now, um, I'm a huge fan of Ubio. Uh, Jessica Richmond, who's the founder of this, and I are in conversations. We're trying to figure out how we take what they're doing and what we're doing and make it something that is really useful for people who want to do these kind of citizen science experiments. I want you to think about it two ways. The way that they run their experiment. Um, it may or may not be able to pick up such a small signal. That's a function of the technology and the number of the length of the reads and the number of reads that they do it. But I want to think about it a bit of a different way. And this is a model. Models don't necessarily represent the truth. They represent the best of our understanding. The things on your skin that will produce things like inflammatory illnesses like acne or rosacea or eczema or things like that, probably represent where a bacteria that might be a normal human skin commensal has now grown to a large enough population that it starts releasing these small molecules called quorum. And this is when bacteria start behaving from individuals and convert to behaving like a mob. They behave like a mob. They start releasing things called virulence factors. And those virulence factors will trigger an inflammatory response. And the inflammatory response is what we see as, if it's P. acne, we'll see it as acne because that's a response within the sweat glands and the pilosebaceous units. When, if it's on the surface of the skin, it might be something like staph producing an atopic dermatitis. So what we have is the microbiome has gone out of balance and it's triggered an inflammatory response. And the clinical syndrome is not the direct response of the bacteria, but it's the host response to the bacteria. So the way to do the experiment ideally is before you start using the mist, you take a swab. Then you would use the mist for, let's call it about a month. And I'm shooting from the hip with that number, but I think that everything we've learned suggests that's right. Then you do a repeat experiment and see to what extent 
the dominant populations have come back into balance and become a small enough part of the population so they no longer cross, cross that quorum threshold and trigger the inflammatory response. Now, she does have the library to pick up nitrosomonas, and she might well pick it up on there. I'm not telling she can or can't. It's just a question of it turns out that you don't need ver very much of a population. And this goes to some of the questions you raised in your earlier blog. These bacteria are, they cannot burn carbon for energy. They're autotrophs. They oxidize ammonia and convert it to nitrite and nitric oxide. And they have to oxidize 25 molecules of ammonia to fix one carbon atom. They're tremendously inefficient in this respect. Now, every time they run this cycle, they also spit out hydrogen ions, which tends to lower the skin pH, which also tend to restore health but they represent a teeny tiny population. However, this teeny tiny population dramatically changes skin chemistry, both in terms of nitrogen chemistry and in terms of the redox or the oxidation reduction potential chemistry. They may in fact be able to transform their microbiome from one which is unbalanced and prone to inflammatory reactions to one which is balanced and least prone to those. And part of the evidence supporting this hypothesis was reported about two months ago in Science by Maria Dominguez Bello in the NYU group that identified what might be the last first human contact of an Aboriginal group in South America, Yanomami group. And she found this group that had no previous contact with Western man. They swabbed their skin, their mouth, and their poop. And they found that a couple of things. Number one, they had a highly diverse microbiome. Not too surprising. They live in the Amazon. They don't apply any chemicals to their face. Two, they contain genes for resistance to many modern antibiotics. That sounds surprising, but it shouldn't be because most of those antibiotics are derived directly or indirectly from soil bacteria. And three, they were covered with ammonia oxidizing bacteria. This was the native state. But even that coverage, it's still a tiny, tiny percentage of that census. So when you send that swab in, and I urge you to do it, um, I think what the folks at UBiome are doing is great work. I'm a huge fan. Jessica is a real visionary in this area. Um, whether or not you're able to pick up the nitrosomonas signal, what you really want to see is do you have a more balanced microbiome? Would there be a more detailed test? You talked about the uh, yeah. biomatrix uh, that the AOS create to, you know, to stay alive. Um, would, would I be able to do like a skin scraping and, and be able to take that to like the lab up here at, at uh, A&M and, and could, they, could they identify that? So the way we're able to do this, we've developed what's called a, Q, a qPCR, a quantitative PCR method. And what we've done is we've, we've completely sequenced the genome of this particular bacteria. We've developed markers for the ammonia oxidase gene, which is unique to this group, as well as another marker that's unique to this particular strain. And we have developed a chip for doing that. We're in conversations right now with UBiome to see if we can develop a collaborative project where people who are using this can actually run that qPCR test as well. And what that looks for is genes that are absolutely unique to this bacteria. Otherwise, Look, you know, I, 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 first of all, I do admire your ambition with this. You won't be able to culture these on agar plates. And that's because, well, first of all, your doubling time is eight to 10 hours. You could grow old before you'd see a colony. Second thing is, they don't use the substrates of agar to grow. They actually need essentially ammonium carbonate. So growing them on plates and enumerating the cell counts and all the things that are very typical to do with heterotrophic bacteria just don't work very well with this. Now, they are common soil bacteria, so they're all, the methods have been developed and reported. But what we basically use when we identify, when we characterize the bacteria, is very specialized systems, and they're not on plates. They're more or less in solution or suspension. And we look for the transformation of ammonia into nitrite as an indication of the level of metabolic activity. Um, that's both a real challenge in terms of our science, 
But it's also a real advantage. If I want to look for contamination of heterotrophic bacteria, the kinds of things that might contribute to illness, because our bacteria don't grow on the plates, we're able to look for those in incredibly sensitive levels. So once you start working with autotrophs, bacteria that don't burn carbon for energy, um, all of the autotrophic methods that we're so commonly used to um, don't work particularly well. Okay. Uh, another question that, that comes up a lot is uh, dealing with hygiene, the use of soap. If we have bacteria that, that adapt so quickly, uh, why haven't there been more species of bacteria adapting to uh, being able to survive soap? And uh, if so, uh, is there any sort of horizontal gene transfer that goes on um, to, you know, to perpetuate that trait? So that is a excellent question. That has, you know, how much time? The first answer I have to that is, how much time do we have? <laughs> uh, but let me make it relatively simple. Every consumer product that you buy today, soaps, shampoos, lotions, etc., contain preservatives. Because if we don't put those in there, bacteria and fungus will grow in them. And then you have a problem. You can't have things on the shelf that go bad quickly. The problem is when you use them, you apply these preservatives to your face or your skin or wherever else it is, and those will alter your microbiome. They are, by very definition, as preservatives, they're antibacterial and antifungal. But the bigger question is why are we, that you're not asking, that you should ask is, why are we using all of these chemicals on our skin? Remember, our biology went through millions of years to optimize itself. I'll give you a perfect example. Let's talk about acne. 85 to 90% of adolescents in Western society have acne, 25% of adult women, about 5 to 10% of adult men. And yet primitive societies don't have it at all. And they don't use any products on their skin. So here's a personal question for you. How often do you shampoo? Well, right now I'm not shampooing at all because you know, uh, I don't want to kill off the uh, nitrous simonis, but um, before I started using this, I would shampoo every day. Okay, and so now that you've stopped, what have you noticed about stopping? Well, the first couple of days, my hair got pretty oily, but it's kind of like, it's kind of sort of ba balanced out a little bit, so it's, it's doing a lot better now. Um, it's softer, it's uh, easier to comb, it's not brittle. It's not dry. Um, so let's come back. Let's come back to this, which is the oil that you generate in the hair follicles in the pilosebaceous units is there for a purpose. It is not toxic. It is not inflammatory. We didn't evolve this so that dermatologists could make a living. In fact, it protects the skin. It protects the skin against water damage as well as other things. If you want to increase the rate in which we produce it. The best way to do that is wash it off because there are feedback loops that will go, wait a second, I made all this stuff to protect the skin and it's gone. I better make more. And for many people, you're actually fortunate that you were able to get to the point where you're comfortable in a week or so. For some people, like almost any chemical addiction, very easy to start, really hard to stop. For some people, it takes weeks and weeks of living with high, high output pyelosebaceous units and sebum get back there. But we didn't need to wash it off. If you don't work around garbage or filth, the idea that we need to use all of these chemicals on our skin, let's put it this way, for most of human existence we were perfectly healthy without doing it. And the argument, well, we're much healthier now, that's not actually true. When you look at these native tribes that are undisturbed, their skin, let's just put it this way, if you look, if you do a search for Yanomamo or Yanomami and you see picture, an image search and you picture their skin, most people would kill for skin that looks as good as that. The only images you will find at all of their skin looks anything other than perfect are images of them with measles and we gave that to them. So once we start applying soaps and shampoos to our skin and to our hair, our physiology and our microbiome will respond. 
when we try to stop that and work ourselves off it, for some people have a much harder time than others. But the people will actually start using less and less. So we have developed a soap and a shampoo that don't contain any preservatives and don't kill the bacteria. And uh, we have a product launch coming up that will include those. And we're very excited about this. Um, but we're going to be the only people selling a, a cleanser and a shampoo. They're going to be encouraging people to use less. It's really good. They won't use them at all. Is, are those uh, are those style based products as well, or, or are you going with a different formula? So here's here's the funny thing. So of the things that are toxic to these keystone peacekeeper bacteria, okay, number one is probably sodium lauryl sulfate. Not a great big surprise to anybody. But almost as bad as that are the true soaps. These are the saponified animal and vegetable fats, Castile soaps, Bronner's, things like that. And it's not a pH factor. We normalize the pH. They are still incredibly toxic to these bacteria. These are the things we have been using as humans for literally thousands of years. So what we had to do is first identify ingredients that were not toxic for bacteria, figure out how to put them together into products that people would find delightful because if we we're going to expect them to migrate from the toxic chemicals, the ones that were not toxic, they were be willing to make some compromises, but not a lot. And we were able to do that and then figure out how it was we're going to put these in the market with no preservative whatsoever. And all of those represented significant challenges. But it's a combination of the chemistry, the preservative system, and how people use people use them. They prolong the viability of the biofilm on the skin. So walk me through your hygiene route. Hygiene route. You wake up. How you do wake you up. How do you yourself? Yourself. Okay, so I like to row. In, I like to row in the morning. So I will, I'll wake up and I'll row for about a half hour and listen to a book, and then I will uh, get in the shower and rinse off with water. And that's it. That's it. That's it. Um, about 70% of the people who are using our cosmetic bacteria report to us they don't need shampoo. They don't need deodorant. And they don't smell. Or at least if they do smell, no one's telling them they smell and they don't perceive it. But about two-thirds don't need deodorant. And that's not too terribly surprising. About a third say they do. And your microbiome and my microbiome and everything has a certain amount of inertia it takes to transform it from where it is today to where it needs to get to be in the healthy state. And if it's something like BO, some people may have a longer tolerance for that transition period than others. We don't really know. We need to do the experiments. We're planning to do the experiments where we sample the microbiome and the armpit of people who are responders and people who are not responders and see if we can sort out the difference. A lot of these a lot of these antiperspirants, antiperspirants, we're not antiperspirants, we're not antiperspirants, but they use they baking use sodas, baking sodas, a lot of ingredients, and that's going to change, and that's going to change the, your underarm, correct? Underarm, correct. How's that going to be the microbiome? So this is a really interesting area to me, and I, I can't tell you that I have an encyclopedic knowledge of it, but this came from work we did both in Cleanwell and here at AOBio, and. So there's, there's two groups, as you correctly point out. There are antiperspirants. Those are regulated as OTC, over-the-counter drugs by the FDA. And those are predominantly these alumina compounds. And they block the production of sweat. And that will obviously dramatically change the, di the microbiome. The other group that's commonly used are just called deodorants. And most of them that are still told, 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 uh, sold today, believe it or not, contain triclosan. They're antibacterial. Now, this very interesting fellow, I urge your readers to go look him up. Go Google this guy. He calls himself Dr. Armpit. And uh, he's got a TEDx talk, which is fascinating. And your BO, to the extent that you have it, there's a genetic component to it. Part of those are sulfur compounds, thiols. Part of it are short and medium chain fatty acids produced by coronabacteria. And those things, depending on the given individual, what he found is the longer that you use antibacterial products in your armpits, 
the worse your BA, BO will be when you stop using it because you move your microbiome to a different place. So to the extent that you have a genetic makeup, it turns out Asians have a lower incidence of BO than, um, than Caucasians because of a particular gene that handles sulfur compounds. What we find is that the ability to get back to the place where the only odor that you might notice um, is the one that is produced by the pheromones in the, in the um, apricot, apricot glands. That's actually a fairly stable place for people. They're quite subtle. Most people don't find them the kind of thing that we regard as BO. But when you develop a microbiome in there that turns these sulfur compounds or other fatty acids into these um, malodorous compounds, those group, we haven't done the microbiome or the chemical studies. It's on the agenda of things to look at, but we're a small company. We can only do so many things at once. I think what we're going to find is there is a way to use a kit like the one you have there from uh, Ubio and determine whether or not you're going to have an easy transition or a harder transition. Well, well we're when in this interview, Dan, in this interview, and I want to end with, with, end with uh, a couple of questions. Like the, questions. First one, the first one coming from a medical doctor, a medical doctor going, into, going into the biotech industry. Biotech industry. Have you learned anything or made any uh, philosophical changes as you've gone into this industry? What have you learned as you've gone into this industry? So I went into medicine because I actually want to have an impact on, on, on health of individuals and on the public as well. And what I find is that there's a dramatic transformation that people are not necessarily aware of today. But your ability to own and have decision-making power into your health is gradually increasing. This is not going to affect our ability to take the cost out of end-of-life care. That's still going to remain a problem. But the prevention and management of chronic illness is increasingly going to sh shift from the job of your position to the one where you have primary responsibility. And for a look at what the future looks like, I recommend you read a recent book by Eric Topol called The Patient Will See You Now, great title. And also take a look at what the other, one of the founders of AO Biome, Jamie Haywood, who founded Patients Like Me, is doing with Patients Like Me. So the idea of being able to participate in the, in a way where people are more concerned about seeking help than seeking the treatment for the preventable chronic illnesses they have is a very exciting time in medicine. And it's, it's, it, is, it is really the thing that I wake up in the morning really excited about participating. Awesome. We'll, we'll put a link to that. We'll put a link to that. Last question. Um, last question is, uh, what, are, is uh, what are some of the what are, what are most facts that you know about the these bacteria are ubiquitous in nature. If you jump in a lake or you swim in a stream or you swim in the ocean, you're exposed to them. Everywhere there's biology, there are. Um, you saw a recent article about six months ago where they uh, drilled down into a uh, subterranean lake in Antarctica and they pulled out the bacteria and sequenced them. A substantial portion were ammonia oxidizing bacteria. I want to introduce you to a term that I learned from French viticulture called terroir. And this is the biological imprint of the soil on the plants that grow there. And typically we consider this to be the minerals and the climate, etc. But I want you to broaden that. This is literally the biological imprint. So when we lived as hunter-gatherers, we lived close to the soil and close to the environment, and our microbiomes were synchronized with those, with those things. That was our terroir. We developed agriculture, animal husbandry, technology, chemistry, and now this cons our, uh, economic architecture of consumer products. And every single one of those has started to cut those links and disconnect us from the environment. I'm going to give you a little exercise in your users. I want you to, I'm going to give you a word. I want you to think of an image. And don't tell you not to tell me what the image is. is so here's the word nature. Now I have a question for you. Any people in that image? No. No. And that's the problem. We have disconnected ourselves from our mother, from the earth, 
that gave birth to us, that has all of these connections we didn't know existed, and we did it at our own peril. So we live a relatively long life, but we have an incredible burden of chronic illness. And what I'm suggesting here is that if we recalibrate the way we look at who we are, and our connection and our context within the broader biology and understand that the microbiology and the microbiome of everything that we eat and everything that we touch is important for our health, that what we can do is we can find a way back to the point where we live longer, healthier lives and we become less dependent on health care and medicine to maintain that. Well. Well, Dr. Weiss, I really appreciate you coming in and coming up with you. I love your valuable time. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks, everybody, for listening. You can get the books, the books. Dr. Weiss discussed and learn more. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Great week. Great week.